Hi, and welcome to this presentation on understanding and preventing conservatorships. This presentation was developed with support from the California Department of Healthcare Services and the Dementia Care Aware Statewide Medical Legal Partnership Network. I'm Sarah Hooper. I'm a professor of practice at UC Law San Francisco, where I direct the UCSF UC Law Consortium on Law Science and Health Policy. My work focuses on the intersection of law, health, and aging with a focus on complex care. And I lead the DCA Statewide Medical Legal Partnership Network. In this video, we are going to provide information about conservatorships so that by the end of it, you'll be able to name key strategies and resources to prevent the need for conservatorship in patients with dementia, that you'll be able to state when the need for conservatorship might arise in dementia care, and that you'll be able to describe the function and limits of conservatorship in dementia care. So let's start with a case illustration. Mr. Herrera is a 76-year-old man with dementia who is living independently in the community. As his illness has progressed, he has had increasing difficulty remembering to pay his rent and utilities. His electricity has now been turned off and he has been issued an eviction notice. He is independent of ADLs and has friends and neighbors that regularly check on him. So Mr. Herrera's care team may rightly be concerned about him and his ability to care for himself in the community. And so it's not uncommon for healthcare teams to ask, does he have capacity? Does he need conservatorship? So let's start by briefly defining conservatorship. Conservatorship is a court process to transfer legal decision-making authority from Mr. Herrera to another person. This is a process that results in a loss of civil rights and is therefore a last resort. It is considered an extreme legal intervention. Probate conservatorship is the most common form of conservatorship in dementia, and there are other forms of conservatorship that I'll talk more about in a minute. But in general, probate conservatorship is the most common form for dementia. However, we have seen more older adults with co-occurring mental illness causing psychosis in which they may be a danger to themselves or others. And in that case, a different kind of conservatorship called LPS may be an, a, an appropriate pathway. But in general, probate is the most common form, and that is what I'm going to talk about today. The other types of conservatorship you may have heard about in California might be guardianship. So in California, other states call guardianship for adults guardianship. In California, what we call guardianship is for minors, so for young people. Limited conservatorship is for adults with developmental disabilities, so usually not for people with dementia. The Lanterman Petrus Short Conservatorship process, which starts with a series of holds known as 5150 and other holds, is the pathway for people with serious mental illness that creates a danger to themselves or others or grave disability. It is a different standard than the standard we use for probate conservatorship. You may also have heard of two new forms of proceedings in California that are related to conservatorship, but a little bit different. One is called care court and the other is called housing conservatorship. I'm not going to be talking about those two today. In general, a person with dementia who just needs help in the community, but without other factors or housing issues or SUD are generally not going to be eligible for care court or housing conservatorship merely because they have dementia. Okay, so again, we're just focusing on probate conservatorship for purposes of this talk. And the standard for probate conservatorship that a judge uses to decide if someone needs conservatorship is as follows. The judge asks, is the patient unable to provide properly for his or her personal needs for physical health, food, clothing, or shelter? That's the standard we use to see if someone needs conservatorship of the person. And or is someone substantially unable to manage his or her own financial resources or resist fraud or undue influence? That's the standard that we use for conservatorship of the estate. And it's possible for someone to have to meet one of these tests and not the other, or they may meet both. And so someone may need a conservator of the person, 
They may need a conservator of the estate for financial matters. They may need both. But in evaluating whether these standards have been met, judges demand that there be proof by clear and convincing evidence. It is our highest civil legal standard, again, because conservatorship is considered a last resort. And the judge will ask, have uh, less restrictive alternatives? And has been tried, are they unavailable or have they just been insufficient to protect the patient? And this piece, the less restrictive alternatives piece, is really critical and was just shored up by legislation in California last year in 2022. So we really mean it. We want to look for alternatives to conservatorship in addition to these high legal standards to make sure that this legal intervention is really necessary for a particular patient. So in thinking about if a particular patient might need conservatorship, a question that I have learned to ask healthcare teams in over a decade of working with them has been the following one. I like to ask, is this a decision-making problem or is this a resource problem? And the reason that I ask that question is because conservatorship is largely a decision-making intervention. It is not a resource intervention. And I have found that this has been a common misunderstanding about conservatorship in the public and among healthcare teams. There's an idea that maybe conservatorship might provide resources that a patient doesn't already have. And that is largely not the function of conservatorship. Conservators are usually family members or other interested people, or if a patient doesn't have anyone who can serve as a conservator, it's the public guardian's office. And those people are just making different decisions than the patient may have been making, and they're having to work with the resources the patient already has, including eligibility that they might already have for programs like Medi-Cal, Social Security, et cetera. So while there is advocacy that some of us can do in the community to make sure that patients are fully optimizing benefits to which they may be entitled, conservatorship by itself does not create new beds, new access to food and nutrition that wasn't already in the community. It just doesn't solve those problems. And often it's the case that our most marginalized patients do want supports and services, but because of poverty, because of literacy, because of a whole host of issues, they may just be facing barriers to accessing those. The other reason it's important to ask this question is because it's an important question to ask when thinking about what alternatives to conservatorship might be. So I like to start by thinking about what the resource problems are and addressing those first. So if we think back to Mr. Herrera, the concerns that the healthcare team may have had were that because of his declining cognitive status, he's having a hard time paying bills. And because of that, he is being evicted. And so um, the decision-making problems are, of course, really important, but it's important to address the resource issues first. Housing and problems managing bills are fundamentally resource issues. We need help dealing with those. So for eviction, this is considered an emergency legal issue for which you should immediately refer a patient to free legal aid. We recommend a statewide resource called lawhelpcalifornia.org in which you can put in the patient's zip code and some particular factors, and then it will provide information about a legal referral that is in the patient's community. Any housing issue for vulnerable older adults can be an emergency health issue. And so it's really important to address that resource first. The timeline for conservatorship is not going to be helpful for housing issues like eviction or even for just general concerns we might have about Mr. Herrera, it's really important to connect him with free legal assistance in the community first. Second, the issue of needing help with paying bills, I think of as uh, a resource issue. Some of us have family members and friends who are able to do this. Some of us don't. We think Mr. Herrera might have some people. He has a a neighbor who seems to be concerned and checking in on him. He might have other people. Before we decide that he needs to be conserved, we need to ask if there is someone who can just help him pay bills. 
And it's really important that the person who is helping him pay bills and manage other decisions be a trustworthy financial caregiver and that he be able to name them, that he have the capacity to name them in legal documents. And so for someone like Mr. Herrera, there's kind of three types of financial caregivers to keep in mind. The first is an agent and a durable power of attorney for finances. That's a legal document that Mr. Herrera can fill out to name someone who can help him pay bills and manage other things. A representative payee is a person who can help him manage his Medi-Cal, his Social Security, and depending on what kind of Medicare he has, may help him manage his Medicare. An agent in a durable power of attorney for finances does not have the authority to manage many of those public benefits. So for someone who has low income, it's important that they have a representative payee as well. Let's say that Mr. Herrera's neighbor is trustworthy and willing to take this on. The neighbor could be named as the agent in durable power of attorney for finances. Mr. Herrera could also designate, essentially request, that the Social Security Administration appoint him as a representative payee. There's a similar process if Mr. Herrera is a veteran by which a VA fiduciary could be named to manage his VA benefits. Unfortunately, the VA does not allow Mr. Herrera to name that person in advance. So that person would need to be requested after Mr. Herrera no longer has ability to manage things himself. So these are three really important types of legally recognized financial caregivers that you should be aware of and encourage your your patients to name as far in advance as possible. But even if we have concerns about their decision-making ability, that doesn't necessarily mean that they no longer have the ability to name these financial caregivers. And so we should ask that question. Do we, do we think that he could still name these types of financial caregivers as an alternative to pursuing conservatorship? So to keep someone like Mr. Herrera independent in the community for as long as possible, there are also commonly a whole host of other services and supports that will be needed to keep him there, including care management, transportation, home delivered meals. He may need some adult daycare. If the neighbor is helping out or if he has someone else who can help, they may need caregiver support. There are a whole host of resources available for older adults in every community, and that is a product of federal and state law. And so if you are not sure where Mr. Herrera could get help with these other supports, just become familiar with two key contacts. One is your area agency on aging in your community, which you can find through aging.california.gov. The other is the statewide network of civil legal aid providers who are the providers that provide free or low cost services to vulnerable older adults and other populations. And you can find those resources at lawhelpcalifornia.gov. Okay, so Sometimes healthcare teams do a great job of marshalling resources, treatment options, a whole host of other things, uh, and Mr. Herrera simply declines them. And the healthcare team really feels that this is not a resource issue. We have those lined up. The problem is that Mr. Herrera is declining them or is making what the healthcare team feels is bad decisions. And this is a really challenging issue for those of us in the helping professions. We are trying very hard to provide people services that we think are in their best interest, and often they do not take our advice, and that is frankly very challenging. So I I feel you on that. But it's important to keep in mind and just remember that adults have a right to decline medical and social services. They have a right to include medical care that is life-sustaining. And they have a right to decline social services, including adult protective services, which is something I've found many healthcare teams misunderstand. And so we should reflect on the reasons that someone may be declining those services. It certainly could be a product of their underlying disease. It may be a product of Alzheimer's or other dementias. However, we should also be really careful to consider a few other issues before we conclude that someone lacks the ability to make decisions for themselves. 
And in particular, for marginalized populations, we should think about the role of trust in systems that many marginalized older adults have over their lifetimes come to understand do not actually have their best interests at heart. And they may have had disrespectful or unhelpful experiences of medical services, of social services, of, of legal systems. And so it may be that someone is declining medical or social services because of their lived experience of those services or those of people that they trust. And it may not be that they misunderstand. It may be that they understand perfectly and they simply, again, ha we have not earned their trust. And that's a hard one. We should also think about the role of literacy and language barriers. So it may be that it's very difficult to assess if someone has capacity because they have very low health or legal literacy or financial literacy at baseline, or maybe the provider is not able to talk to them in their first language. And so we should take steps to address the literacy and language barriers. And of course, many uh, older adults are entitled to receive information about their care and options in a language that they understand. We also should think about the role of hearing loss, vision, other disabilities requiring accommodation that may be affecting an older adult's ability to engage in the conversation. And it is important to underline that if an older adult has hearing loss, vision challenges, those are disabilities that require accommodation. And we can use things like pocket talkers or other tools to help providing information either in writing in large font or orally. There are a host of ways that we can improve our communication to make sure that what we are facing is is truly not a decision-making problem, um, and it's truly a, a difficulty in the older adult understanding what's happening. So for some more helpful assistance in thinking about capacity assessment with different uh, marginalized populations, I recommend the capacity assessment trainings available at DementiaCareAware.org. So related to my earlier point, that older adults don't necessarily, you know, have the ability to decline services that they don't trust or that they don't understand. It's important to keep in mind that the law states that a positive cognitive screen or a dementia diagnosis does not automatically mean that the person lacks legal capacity, right? So those things do not automatically equal legal incapacity. By law, Mr. Herrera is entitled to a legal presumption of capacity, and this is true beyond dementia, actually. A diagnosis of any mental or physical disorder in California does not mean that an individual lacks capacity to make their own decisions, and it requires a much more specific assessment, and there must be evidence of deficits. Those deficits must significantly impair a person's ability to meet a particular legal standard of an act or a decision in question. So earlier when I said that, you know, Mr. Herrera may have a diagnosis of dementia, he may have some trouble managing uh, his finances on his own, that those would be things that should be important flags about his decision making. But by themselves, those two things doesn't mean that he lacks the legal capacity to name someone who can help him manage finances. So we look at differently, uh, different acts or decisions and think about whether Mr. Herrera is functionally able to do that specific thing. And just because we've decided that he may not be able to do one thing doesn't mean that he's now suddenly unable to do all things. Capacity is not all or nothing. So some alternatives to conservatorship, again, if the issue is decision making, is to ask the question, do we think he has the capacity to name trusted surrogates and supporters as early as possible? So we want him to do this as early as possible, but even if uh, he's progressed somewhat, if he hasn't yet named someone, that would be the first question we would ask. Could he still do that? We have a new mechanism in California called supported decision-making agreements that are recognized alternatives 
to conservatorship in which Mr. Herrera could name someone who can support him in making a whole host of decisions from medical decisions to financial decisions and other issues. A healthcare agent in an advanced directive would be a critical decision maker uh, for Mr. Herrera as he uh, ages and needs more support. And it's important in California that a healthcare agent actually be named in the advance directive. The reason for that is that he, although Mr. Herrera can name someone orally who is annotated in the chart, that chart does not flow easily with Mr. Herrera across settings of care. And we know that people with dementia will churn through many settings of care, including hospitals, long-term care, outpatient clinics, and it would be much better to facilitate his care and his care transitions if he had a duly named healthcare agent in an advanced directive, and that he and that caregiver knew to bring that document with them wherever they go. Financial caregivers, as we've discussed, are really important for helping Mr. Herrera pay for the kinds of health and personal care that he will need as his dementia progresses. And so financial caregivers are a really critical tool in dementia care. And it's important for healthcare teams to encourage patients to name someone they trust in these documents as early as possible. And we should make this a standard part of quality dementia care. So a couple of planning resources for you. I've named the top one a few times, but just to reiterate that there are free and low cost civil legal services in the community for older adults, and you can find them at lawhelpcalifornia.org. There is a new tool that will be coming out in 2024 that is an educational tool for people like Mr. Herrera to learn about financial and legal caregiving and the steps they can take to prepare for uh, someone else to assist them with a range of financial and legal decisions. And then finally, Prepare for Your Care is an evidence-based tool that has been around for over a decade that has videos and other supports for patients to engage in advanced care planning for medical decisions. So recommend those three resources to you. And I, finally, I just wanted to address uh, that the other reason that we may be thinking about conservatorship is if we suspect physical, financial, or other forms of elder abuse and neglect. And what I will say about elder abuse and neglect and conservatorship is that conservatorship is often the only, unfortunately, tool to help address elder abuse. And so in that case may be warranted. And the clinician's role in cases of suspected elder abuse is, of course, to file a confidential report with APS. As mandated reporters, this would be an obligation whether or not we think conservatorship is the remedy for that elder abuse. And here are the resources for you to make those reports. You need not know that elder abuse and, and neglect is occurring. You must merely suspect that it is occurring in order to make a confidential report. I will also urge you to consider making a referral to civil legal aid, which is also engaged in advocating for older adults like Mr. Herrera, who may have experienced loss of Medi-Cal benefits or housing or other things due to financial exploitation and may need assistance with those resources and are experts in dealing with elder abuse more generally. So I suggest, um, in addition to making a report to APS, consider making referral to civil legal aid so that civil legal aid can assist Mr. Herrera. Okay, so if we decide that conservatorship is really needed, um, let's review what the healthcare team's role would be. So as I've been describing, much of conservatorship is about underlying needs and resources and assessing alternatives to guardianship first. So please do, if considering conservatorship or thinking that conservatorship is a remedy for your patient, think first about what the actual underlying needs are and the alternatives and see what you can do to address those first. In general, healthcare teams are not actually filing a petition for probate conservatorship. The role of healthcare teams in probate conservatorship is different from the role of healthcare teams in LPS conservatorship. 
The most you may be doing in probate conservatorship is making a referral to the public guardian's office. And the public guardian's office would be filing the petition and assessing whether, uh, uh, doing their own assessment of whether probate guardian conservatorship is actually needed. If uh, someone, a family member or the public guardian's office decides to file the petition for probate conservatorship, they may come to ask you to provide information and an expert opinion. And it's important to remember uh, that you should only do so if you know what your institution's HIPAA pro protocols are, because of course, information about Mr. Herrera's capacity is part of his medical record. It's, it's his private PHI. And so before providing that information, you want to make sure that you have consent or have otherwise consulted your own institution's HIPAA procedures for releasing that information. If you suspect abuse, you should absolutely report it to APS. Um, but don't feel the need to conduct your own investigations. That is not expected of healthcare teams, and it is very difficult to do well from where you sit in the healthcare system. Elder abuse cases and conservatorship cases can be very complicated and have very complex extended facts um, that take people in the community a long time to develop, uh, which is part of why elder abuse and conservatorship uh, processes can take a very long time. You may be asked, uh, if you are asked to provide information about a patient in relationship to conservatorship, you may be asked to fill out what's called the capacity declaration. This is an accepted statewide form that is used in probate conservatorship proceedings. Um, and you may be asked to fill it out for a number of reasons. You may be asked to fill it out just to say whether the patient can attend their hearing. Uh, you may be asked to fill it out to say, give your opinion as to whether a patient has capacity to give informed consent to medical treatment. Or you may be asked to fill it out for purposes of saying whether the conservator should be able to place someone in a secured perimeter facility, such as in dementia care unit of assisted living. And so you can see here that there are checkboxes uh, that you would be asked to fill out. You are not required to have an opinion on all of these things. You can fill it out to the best of your ability and simply state, you know, that you don't know or you don't want to state if there are pieces of it you're not comfortable with. You are also invited at the end of this form to attach additional information. So if you feel that this form is not conveying or not assisting you in conveying your opinion to the court, um, you can certainly attach a document and, and write it in your own words. And it's important to remember that the court will treat this as a piece of evidence. It will be highly uh, persuasive because medical opinions can be very persuasive in court, but they are not the final say on whether someone will have conservatorship imposed or not. It is the judge's responsibility to look at this as well as all of the other evidence and make a decision uh, about whether someone needs conservatorship. Okay, so that was a lot, but what I really want you to take away from this video today is uh, that we shouldn't wait for conservatorship to solve what is fundamentally a resource problem, that we must optimize decision-making supports in order to maximize a patient's capacity, that we should encourage patients to name trustworthy health and financial agents, and that the longer we delay medical and financial advanced care planning, the more we are increasing the risk of conservatorship in patients with dementia. So the good news is that probate conservatorship is often something we can avoid if we engage in advanced care planning early and often and really encourage patients to name people that they trust and to put those decisions in legal documents that can serve them across settings. So thank you very much. If you'd like more information on this and other topics, please visit MLP training at uclawsf.eu.